very early days of setting up my own company, um, I used Apple Macintoshes. I used them because they were the only computers that I could network. I couldn't, I couldn't network PCs, I could only network Apples. And in those days, and I don't know, uh, looking around, the majority of the audience around here will probably remember, when people said, so what computers do you use? And you said, I use an Apple. You had that slightly sympathetic look of, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> and of course, the turnaround since those days, that now we have the Apple products literally everywhere. We're using them all the time. And of course, not only are you and I using them, but millions and millions of people around the world are using them every single second of every single day. Our next speaker joined Apple in 1978. He was one of the very first employees, amongst the first 50, I think. And he joined as director of new products. In 1985, he decided to turn his attention to the classroom to see how technology can revolutionize the process of learning in the classroom. He took over a failed school and he turned it around. But the lure of Apple was just a little too much. He went back and he is now the Vice President of Education for Apple. Please welcome John D. Cowan. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk about new dimensions of learning, engaging a new generation of students. But let me start very simply by sharing with you the pedagogy that was commonplace when I went to school. Uh, this is my high school yearbook, uh, actually from Chateau, France. And my fellow classmate wrote, Aristotle and Couch are now synonymous. Keep memorizing those problems. All right? That's what we did. We memorized everything. You know, here's A, here's B, here's a linear process for me to be, read the chapter, answer the questions, the test is on Friday. A number of things changed my attitude towards the pedagogy in the classroom. Probably the first was in my junior year in college, I was a physics major. And as I walked into an exam, there was one question in the exam, and it was describe the motion of a spinning top in free space. It had never been covered in the lecture, it was not in the book, and a whole class panicked because we had not memorized the answer to that question. Ironically, the same year, I was taking a course called Horticultural Science 120. It happened to be computer programming. It was the only department back in those days that could afford a computer. And the pedagogy in that class was entirely different because in a programming environment, there is no right or wrong answer. You're asked to fundamentally be creative, to be logical, to, to sort of visualize, if you will, the problem and solve the problem. That was it for me. From that point on, I transferred to UC Berkeley because it was one of the only schools in the country at the time that offered a computer science degree. And that's what my background is. And I, that's, that's sort of the first story. The second story is I met Steve Jobs in 1978. He was 20 years old, I was 29, and he shared with me his vision for Apple. And he had just read an article in Scientific America where they had, they had run a test on motion from point A to point B with man and animals. And man was a very disappointing bottom of the list. But someone had the foresight to rerun the test, this time with man riding a bicycle, which amplified his physical ability. So Steve saw technology as an amplifier for our intellect, and he referred to it as the mental bicycle. Not to take us where we've already been, but to allow us to explore, to create, and to innovate. So that really resonated with me. And so Steve says, we're going to build a personal computer. I said, great, where's the book? And he goes, there is no book. And I said, OK, well, can you point me to a faculty member or someone who's done this before? And he goes, no one's ever done this before. And that was sort of the second you know, cold shower that said, whoa, what did I learn in school? I learned how to be, how to memorize, how to consume content, but I didn't really learn how to solve problems that hadn't been solved before. In fact, most of the answers were, to the odd questions were in the back of the book. Right? This was a question. So that challenged me. The third thing that he did 
is he came into my home on a Friday night and he put an apple II on the kitchen table and he told my then four-year-old son Christopher, you can have this if your dad comes to work for me. Okay? Well, I was working at Hewlett Packard at the time and we were building computers that cost $250,000. And all of a sudden, here was a computer, a mental bicycle, sitting on the kitchen table. And that weekend, the TV never went on. Right? And my son rode that mental bicycle to places that I didn't think a four-year-old was capable of doing. Right? This is a picture of Christopher a few years later, 1984, sitting in front of the first graphical user interface personal computer, the Lisa. Those boxes in the background are five megabyte hard drives that cost $1,000 in 1984. Today, our phones have uh, 200 gigs, 128 gig, gigs on them, okay? And the reason I tell this story is because Christopher grew up within the culture of Apple, which was a culture of empowerment. How do we use technology to empower the individual, right? He went on to the University of Pennsylvania where they allowed him to write his own major, which was an engineering major, minor in design, and he also had his own column in the Daily Pen. So he could program, he could design, and he could write. His first job coming out of the University of Pennsylvania was to design eBay's website. Think about it. eBay didn't exist, the internet didn't exist, websites didn't exist. All right? And it was 10 years after he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania before they created the major for digital arts, computer science and digital arts. So this is kind of the, the background. Um, you know, I told Christopher, because he didn't, I, I, you know, I said, Chris, don't get too attached to this because I may have to return it. Because in the early Apple days, no one made more than $40,000 from the CEO down. So I was being asked to take a pretty substantial pay cut and go from managing a very large group to working for Steve, a 20 year old, right? <laughs> And uh, so I told Chris, don't get too attached to this. He said, why, Dan? I said, well, if I don't take the job, i got to bring it back. And he looked at me and he said, well, just say yes, Dad. Right? <laughs> and the rest is kind of history. So stepping forward, in 2002, after 10 years of being involved in an educational institution, Steve asked me to come back. Christopher's on the right-hand side. My grandson, namesake Jonathan, is in the middle. When I look at this picture, I say, well, you know what? Chris may have been the first digital native growing up within the Apple culture, having a $10,000 Lisa when he was six years old, okay? So if he's a digital native, and I'm, I didn't have computers growing up, so I'm a digital immigrant, right? But hopefully after 40 years, I'm naturalized. The real question, what is John Emerson, right? What are the students that are now coming into our schools today? You know, Alan Kay once said, technology is only technology to those born before the technology, right? So we tend to look at technology as a tool. They look at technology as an environment. In fact, John Emerson wouldn't talk to me on a phone because he had a built-in camera and he wanted to see Papa. All right? In fact, I was the other day, I have 12 grandkids, by the way, and they're all powered with iPad minis. And one of my younger granddaughters went into home the other day and saw a landline phone and said, Papa, how come the phone has a tail on it, right? So this is a new generation. Now, we did our first study, and probably the only longitudinal study ever done on the impact of technology on learning. And it was back done in, in, in those years, uh, 1985 to 1997. And what we learned was very simple, that if students are engaged, they're gonna learn. Engagement can come from technology, engagement can come from a great teacher, engagement can come from you know, doing something that's relevant rather than simply memorization. Uh, but you know, what I wanted to kind of give you a picture is the nature of this generation we're talking about. Now, I originally did this slide for a, a tour of Southeast Asia universities, and I wanted to point out to them you know, sort of the background, the history of the incoming freshman class. So that was this year's freshman class. If you look at it, they were three years old when Google was created. So unlike myself, they probably never marched to a library, to a card catalog system, to the Dewey Decimal System to look something up. They simply do a search. They were six years old when the iPod came out. Now the importance here is not the iPod itself, the device itself, but the ecosystem that was created around music in terms of a new way to purchase music, a new way to collect music, a new way to listen to music. 
nine years old when Facebook came out. A collaborative environment that allowed them to share with their friends in a social environment. Probably had more functionality than the learning environments at that particular time. 11 years old when Twitter came out. The ability to publish, the ability to share ideas. 12 years old when the iPhone. Again, another ecosystem, right? Not just a box, but a complete app store. And, and you know, think about it. The carriers used to control the functionality and the UI of our phones. Apple flipped that and created a whole ecosystem around the iPhone and, you know, the rest is history, really, right? Um, 13 years old when the App Store came out, which means they probably never walked into a retail store to buy an app. It's been delivered to them. How do you think they'd like their academic content delivered to them? And finally, the iPad when they were 15 years old. And this picture doesn't get, you know, it gets more challenging, because if you think about it, this year's primary school kids were two years old when the iPad came out. Right? This is the generation that is now sitting in our, in our classrooms. And so Apple, you know, and Steve looked at this and said, wow, we need a new learning environment. We need a new device. We need a new ecosystem for learning. A learning environment that's going to meet the needs of this generation and also the needs of society as we go forward. And so we did another research project, this time because the internet existed, and tablets existed, we call it ACOT2, or Apple's Classroom Tomorrow, today. And what did we find? We found that the pedagogy, that the classroom, needs to be creative. It needs to be relevant. It needs to be collaborative. And it needs to be challenging. Okay? That's a far cry from the classroom when I went to school, which was all about consumption of content and the memorization of that content. You know? It's not so important that we know that Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492. What's important is what was happening around the time. What impact? How did that change society? So this is, these are the four components that need to be part of a pedagogy of a learning system. And so with that, we sat back and said, you know, why? The first question that I ask any institution when I work with them is, why does your institution exist? Not what you do, but why, all right? And for us, I think Einstein's quote that said, everybody's a genius, but if you ask a fish to climb a tree, he'll spend the rest of his life thinking he's stupid. When we think about it, we ask every student to do the same thing. And yet, each student is uniquely different. And that's our why. We believe we are in education because we believe that each individual student has a unique genius, all right? And as educators, we should help that student find what their unique genius is and what their passion is. You know, my daughter really struggled through school when it was in her sophomore year in college when she took her first art course. And her sorority sister said to her, what are you doing in pre-law? You've got this natural gift for art. So she called Parsons the design school, created a portfolio, and became a fashion designer. And she said to me, she said, you know, Dad, for 14 years, I pushed the education ball up the hill. And it wasn't until I understood where I was uniquely gifted and where my passion was that I could chase the education ball down the hill. So our goal, if our vision is that we believe in every student, our goal really became, you know, how do we build a learning environment? And Steve challenged us. And he said, all books, learning materials, and assessments should be digital, digital and interactive, tailored to each student and providing feedback in real time. To me, assessment, the new assessment is feedback. It's not these big, humongous, you know, tests that we take, but it's going to be real-time feedback to the teacher as to where that student is at any given time. So this gave us the what we wanted to do. We needed to build a personal learning environment. We needed to build a learning environment that met the needs of this generation of students, right? That's our what. That's what we've been attempting to do for the last 12 years. And I'd like to kind of share with you what that learning environment looks like. But I'm going to lay out the foundation of some academic models that underpin, if you will, that learning environment. And the first is the TPAP model. And what the TPAP model really says is, it's not about the box, but it's about the ecosystem that's created. 
It's about the symbiotic relationship between the technology, the content, and the pedagogy in the classroom. And I have seen so many mistakes around the world where governments basically say, well, we'll get a local manufacturer, we'll buy a $200 box, we'll put it into the schools, and the outcomes will change. No, they don't. Because they're not paying attention to the model. They're simply throwing a piece of technology at the school, at the student, and expecting different results. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Definition of insanity from Einstein, right? The second model is, is the SAMR model, which came out of the Maine Learning Initiative, which Governor King started a one-to-one -one in 2002. Okay, and it said technology can be used as a substitution, but it won't change any outcomes. You really need to use technology to empower you to do something that you couldn't do without the technology. And I'm going to provide an a, a fair example of that towards the end of the, end of the talk. And unfortunately, again, I've seen too many institutions use technology as a substitution, right? I'm going to give you this technology, and I'm going to allow you to do the same thing you've always done before, maybe a little cheaper, maybe a little faster, but it doesn't change the pedagogy in the classroom. It doesn't change the learning environment at all. So those two models, if you look at Apple's education history, which is over 30, 35 years, you know, we kind of marched along here. Uh, we recognized early in 2002 that it wasn't about marching down to a lab for one hour or two hours of access a week. It was really about giving a student a personal computer that was with them 24-7. All right, and then, but we also realized that we needed a new technology. We needed a new platform. So Steve invested, we invested in, uh, in the iPad as a new technology, new way to create content, new way to distribute content, new way to pay for content, with the hopes that we could actually change the pedagogy into the classroom. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today, is what does that look like? So, when I look at new dimensions in learning, I've broken it down into three components. The content, collaboration, and context. You know, I meet a lot with university presidents and they say, look, if all your faculty are doing is presenting readily available content, content that can be found in iTunes U from any one of the 1,400 universities, and not presenting that content in a relevant, challenging context, then what's your value? I sent four kids through college in the U.S. cost me $250,000 each, right? I now have 12 grandkids and I'm scared to death, right? So something's gonna change. They're either going to have to, if, if all they're gonna do is present readily available content, I can go online and get that content today. You know, the complete IB, baccalaureate content is online. Uh, universities have put their content online. So I wanna go through these very quickly. Content is all about access, curation of that content, and hopefully creation, right? And, and Apple has always been about empowering individuals to express themselves, to be able to create. Right. I'm not going to talk much about this because I, I want to keep the conversation at a, at a high level of learning, but obviously there's a lot of content out there. Apple has certainly contributed to this, and so have many, many others. You know, we have over a million apps, over a million, two million books. Uh, we have uh, almost a million media files, uh, more than 10,000 public courses on iTunes U alone. Uh, you know, in songs and TV shows. So the content there. But what Bloom's Taxonomy tells us is not about accessing the content, but it's really about creating the content, right? I mean, when you look at this, high order thinking skills are not remembering, are not memorizing. In fact, I've been working very, a, a lot with uh, John Medina, who wrote Brain Rules. And you know, John told me, he says, you know, he goes, it takes 10 years for a fact to be put in your permanent memory. And I said, oh, that can't be true. I mean, our whole education system in the US is based on memorization, right? And if it takes 10 years for that fact to stay there, wow, are we in trouble. And I said, he said, well, you want me to test you? And I said, yes. He goes, what was your phone number when you were in elementary school? And I said, oh, 714-682-6377. He goes, what was your phone number when you were in college? I haven't a clue. But I had 10 years in elementary school, right, in that phone environment that I remember. So it's really about creation. And that's where Apple has really put its investment. We've built a number of creation apps, as you see, and I'm sure you're most of them are familiar with, and they're all free. 
because we believe the classroom should be about creation. It should be allowing the students to express their mastery of the information in a creative fashion. Uh, and we've taken that content and we've packaged it. We've, you know, there's so much content out there, and I tell the world, content's going to be free. You know? It's what you do and how you put that content in a relevant, challenging context. But we've tried to make it easier for you to search, and so we've, we've broken the content down into, into these kinds of categories and levels. And we've also, you know, if you look at it, we've also broken it down by nursery school, primary school, secondary school, you know, the UK. And these are just some of the examples of the content. So a lot of content out there. And we've also sat back and said, how do we empower an individual to be an author? All right? When I wrote my college textbook, you know, I had to do it on a, uh, in those days, a typewriter. I didn't even have a word processor. And I think I made a dollar and a quarter on my textbook. What we've done with iBooks Author is basically created a platform that lets anyone, anyone in this room, create a book, not as we know a book in terms of textual, but almost, you know, simulations, built-in assessment, an environment that they can now distribute through the iTunes, you know, the bookstore to 155 countries overnight and take 70% royalties. So it's challenging the traditional publishing industry, and a lot of schools and universities are now creating their own books and bypassing the publishing industry. Now, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, people can only perceive what they see, right? And I remember when the steam locomotive engine technology came over to the U.S. two centuries ago, the first publication in the paper had the steam locomotive engine hauling three stagecoaches because they thought it would replace the horse rather than change the whole infrastructure for transportation, okay? So we felt that we needed to build the first book. So we worked with the Biodiversity Foundation and E.O. Wilson, one of the world's foremost biologists at Harvard, to build the book. There's 40 chapters in that book. It's freely available in the, in the bookstore. And it gives you an example, I think, of the SAMR model in terms of how technology can now do some things that could not be done in the traditional book setting. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. But also what we've done is we've taken some of these apps and we've built iBooks around these apps. And so we've taken some of your uh, the, the apps that are more popular apps that are used in education and we've used our Apple Distinguished Educators and we've and we said, you know, show, you know, show what you know, and we built little vignettes, if you will, and how those apps, put them in context, can be used in the learning environment. In fact, I think last year, we trained more than 30,000 teachers here in the UK alone. Right? And this is just kind of an example. There's built-in video, there's built-in assessment, and, and types of things. So that's all I want to say about content. It's growing, it's going to be free. So our differentiation, if you will, has got to be more than just content. Uh, the second component, which I think is really important, is called collaboration. And, you know, our students are already in a collaborative world, right? Um, they're out there in Facebook, they're out there on YouTube, Twitter, etc. Now, one thing you may not know is that there's an academic model by Vygorsky that talks about the zone of proximal development. And what he says is, is if the blue circle represents what a student can learn unaided. There's this zone of proximal development between what cannot be accomplished by that student and what he knows that can be accomplished when they collaborate, they work with a teacher, they work with a peer. And it's kind of a recursive function. The more collaboration, the more they learn, the more their knowledge base goes. So this is kind of, you know, when I was in school, collaboration would have been called cheating. Right? Today, it's, an, it's a critical component of the learning system. Okay? So this is the traditional classroom, the teacher and the student. And when I was in school, it was, as a teacher, I have the knowledge, I'm imparting that knowledge to you as a student. Today, in a more collaborative environment, the classroom should look like this. There should be a relationship between the teacher and the student. The student should be able to go outside the four walls to bring the expertise that they need in, all right? And whatever they do should have a relevant impact on their, on their community. 
And let me give you an example of that. Um, this is kind of, you're not going to be able to read this, but I'll tell you the story. This was my, done by my youngest son in 2001. He was in biology, 10th grade in the U.S. And he came to me and he said, Dad, he said, i got to do a science project. And I go, yes, sir, I know it's part of the standards. I said, what are you thinking about? He said, well, I've been reading about these deformed frogs, these frogs that they're finding with multiple legs. I'm really interested in that. And I thought, wow, man, I don't know anything about that. Um, teacher didn't know anything about that. Um, they said, you know, there's, there's not going to be any books in the library on it. Uh, in fact, you may not even find any scientific publications on it. At best, you may find uh, a newspaper article. Uh, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to go to the internet. And I'm going to do a search on deformed frogs. And I said, okay, come back when you're done and let me know what you found. So he comes back and he goes, there's three premises. One is ozone layer depletion, ultraviolet light zapping these frogs, causing multiple legs. The other is pesticides in agricultural land washing down into a pond, deforming these frogs. And the third is, he said, a professor in upstate New York in a junior college has written a paper that says that he found a parasite in these deformed frogs. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to email the professor in upstate New York to see if I can get a hold of one of those parasites. I went, great, what are you going to do with a parasite? He goes, I'm going to extract the DNA of the parasite, and then I'm going to try to determine how close it matches the known protein involved in limb generation. So I thought, wow, this kid's going to fail, you know? Um, but he had a teacher who said, this is science. Go for it. So he emailed the professor. The professor was flabbergasted. So he said, yes, I can, sh I can get those parasites for you. I'll meet you in Oregon in a summer month. So the kid packs up his, his notebook, his digital camera, goes, they find these parasites, they host them stands, they pack them with the dry ice. He flies to New York with the professor at midnight, in the dark, the parasites come out of the snails, all under a electron microscope. The professor teaches them how to extract DNA, amplify the DNA. He submits it to a website that evaluates uh, DNA sequences, and it comes back and it says, the DNA of the parasite is 98% homologous to the known protein. So he writes up the science fair and says, this is equivalent of a terrorist going to the cockpit of an airplane, removing the pilot, and taking it in a new direction. Wins the science fair, gets a call from Dr. Doug Brutlog at Stanford University, and said, how would you like to spend your summer with me, continue your research? He goes, no, I play basketball in the summer, okay? But it's an example of a true learning environment. It's challenging, it's relevant, it's collaborative, right? And it's engaging. So, moving forward, context, okay, uh, context it needs to be relevant, it needs to be challenging, right? I don't know if you've seen this, but this was a study done by a MIT researcher, followed the students around, measuring their brain waves for a week, found that the brain waves for the students watching TV and sitting in class were the same, flat line, right? Most teachers go, well, they probably slept in my class. No. That's the brainwave for students sleeping, you know, in, at the time, okay? So the challenge is, how do we get this brainwave activity in the classroom, right? And I think the way to do that is by making it, like I said, relevant, collaborative, and challenging. So I put this little model together, and I said, if you walked in your classroom today and measured the pedagogy that's taking place in the classroom based on context, collaboration, or content, my gut feeling is it would be high on content, and low with the other areas. And that's why we developed a framework called challenge-based learning. And challenge-based learning is like project-based learning, but the teacher doesn't pick the project, the student picks the project. And therefore, it's relevant to them. They usually pick something that's much more challenging than we, as a, as a teacher, would, would give them. So that's just a little model that you can look at. We also created an, uh, an environment called iTunes U, which really is, can be the repository of all the digital media that the, that the teacher needs in order to distribute to the, to the student. Um, this is an example, I think you've probably heard about the 90 plus iTunes U public courses that the Stephen Purse Foundation has done. Uh, it's all over. What, one of the things that we've done as well is we've taken the biology book from Keo Wilson and we built a curriculum around that. We'll be piloting it in, around the world this fall and the students will actually be going out on field trips 
collecting data, collecting information, crowdsourcing that will come back into this environment. Again, collaborative, relevant, and challenging. Right? Seth Groden said, never again is someone going to pay you to give them answers they can look up online. They're only going to pay you to solve problems and yet have answers. All right? So our, our pedagogy in our classrooms is, you know, uh, is, is out of peace with, uh, with what the world is looking for. So Steve again said, all books, learning materials should be digital. And they also said, tailored to each student and providing feedback in real time. And that's where our learning environment is moving towards. How do we do that? A lot of people call it personal learning. I call it targeted pedagogy, because when I was the CEO of a genomics company, we used technology to process the data in the human genome with the idea that we would find the protein that was uniquely tailored to your DNA. It's the same challenge in education. How do we find the learning activity that's uniquely tied to the student's own gap in their knowledge? And so, I'd like to wrap up with this. This is a typical fifth grade class in Chicago, Illinois. And as you can see here, the blue represents reading level. And I have one student reading at the eighth grade level and one student reading at the first grade level. All right? How, as a teacher, do I meet the needs of this kind of diverse environment? In fact, there's another academic model called FLOW that says, if I have a um, high challenge and a low skill, I have frustration and I have anxiety. And John Medina says, look, if, you're, if your student's anxious, the learning shuts down, the brain shuts down. And vice versa, if I have a high-skilled student and a low challenge, then I've got boredom. So it's not simply for the teacher to give every student the same thing. She's got to find the flow for each individual student. So I took a quick pass at how many hours a week would this take our teachers, right? To do a pretest, to curate, to find the appropriate learning activity, to send that activity to each individual student, and then to test each individual student for that gap in their knowledge. And guess what, folks? It's more than 40 hours. I've seen this number as high as 128 hours. You know? Steve used to ask me to do these incredible tasks in the most unbelievable short time. And I used to tell Steve, you know, Steve, I believe in miracles, but only God can schedule them. Okay? In a sense, we've asked our teachers to schedule a miracle every week of the year. We have a flawed system. So what happens is we lose the top of the, we lose the bottom. And we teach it to the wrong minimum. So we're not meeting the needs of each individual student. I'm gonna wrap up here. This is just gives you an example. We've worked with a company called eSparks that uses technologies to vet the apps and then delivers the appropriate app to the student based on the gaps in the Northwest Educational Assessment Test. This was the breakdown of the students and these, and the, you know, these 300 students. And Northwest Educational Assessment says 70% needs to be the test score if you're moving towards college. After using the technology for one semester, this is the difference between the growth of those students. So the point here is we need technology. We need technology as an analytic engine to help the teacher. I, I'm afraid that in most cases, technology has been robot to the teachers. But going forward, technology will really empower the teachers to meet the needs of each individual student. Uh, you can go to eSparks, the website, and find a, a white paper. It'll, it'll document in much more detail some of the things that I've talked about this morning in terms of the academic model and have more results. This is my four-year-old, now four-year-old grandson who knows how to read, he knows his numbers, and he knows his phonics. And we put him in the first, in the kindergarten, and we're scared to death. Because he's sitting there waiting now for everybody to catch up. So what I've done here is I'm having him take the Northwest Educational Assessment Test online, and I'm having eSparks recommend the appropriate apps to me as a parent that will help my son overcome any gaps that he's got. So if we think that, that we have a monopoly on learning in our educational institutions, I really do believe that the technology that Apple is building with others uh, will work just as well outside the classroom walls as inside the classroom walls and will empower us as parents to really provide the environment for our sons or daughters. And lastly, wrapping up, Apple now looks at education 
not as a market, but as a value. Tim Cook calls it the great equalizer. Okay? I think I just read an article the other day that said more than 50% of our students in the United States now live in poverty. Well, the only thing that's going to get them out of that poverty is education. So we really look at education now as a value. We're working on a sort of a um, Connect Ed program where we've chosen 114 schools of the poorest uh, uh, poverty schools in the United States. We're going to be their partners from here on out. Um, technology, infrastructure, pedagogy, uh, professional development, everything's called Connect Ed. It'll be our third ACOT, if you will. We're working with Science Research Institute to do the research. And we're going to learn a lot about how technology can empower some of the poorest poverty schools in the United States. And I'll wrap up with, uh, with my, one of my favorite quotes that says, the way we design our classrooms today will ultimately define our societies tomorrow. And I thank you for your time. Appreciate it. It's one of the things that I find fascinating about the Red Arena. I've uh, been lucky enough to moderate it for the last uh, couple of years.